So our next speaker is going to be Ed Weinberg. He's from the ESSRE Consulting Company. Well, thank you. Uh, so now for a completely different story on pea recovery and a different technique for valorizing manure treatment uh, while doing uh, especially phosphorus recovery. Uh, so my presentation outline, uh, the introduction and background, YP recovery, or in particular, soluble P recovery, uh, some current practices and developments that we've learned and heard about uh, uh, throughout the conference today, a little bit of a touch on ag fertilizer prices, and then I'm going to go into uh, total nutrient recovery from wastewaters. Uh, where I'll introduce some advanced uh, nanomaterials that are absorptive, uh, absorptive media uh, highly, uh, with high affinity for phosphorus and uh, talk about the uh, phosphorus pathways to surface water, uh, point and non-point source removal. Uh, so we can look at uh, manure treatment, industrial water plants, municipal water plants, or non-point source or even legacy pee out in impaired uh, uh, water bodies and uh, summarize it with the valorization story that talks about uh, uh, the five R's treatment principle that uh, I'll explain uh, at the end of the presentation, and basically a different nutrient transformation process uh, other than land applied dry uh, uh, fertilizer products. And the media can also remove nitrate. Uh, and uh, I'll close it with uh, some of the uh, discussion of the non-fertilizer reuses of recovered pea. So why pollutant nutrient, soluble reactive phosphorus recovery? Mostly environmental. We, we all, I mean, we've got some poster child pictures of these uh, horrendous uh, harmful algae blooms. Uh, <clears throat> bottom one is uh, Western Lake Erie. Uh, another Ohio one, Grand Lake St. Mary's. The last summer, the St. Lucie River uh, in Florida. Uh, and then you've got the uh, Gulf of Mexico dead zone. So we've got uh, you know, harmful to, to, to recreation areas, uh, harmful to aquatic life. Uh, a, a real big, big environmental driver uh, and with uh, Warmer climates uh, and all the nutrient uh, discharge into a shallow lake like Lake Erie, uh, you're just going to see more intensive, more frequent uh, uh, of these blooms. Uh, but the other angle is that pea is a finite resource. So even recovering the small amount of dissolved phosphorus that doesn't get captured in these recovery systems uh, will go a long way to uh, uh, staving off the uh, PP mantra where if you have a finite resource, eventually demand will outstrip production, which is the peak point, and then you get into pricing, socioeconomic situations, uh, and, and a real concern, again, uh, regardless of where you think peak P will actually occur, I mean, these first models were developed uh, around 2010, and the peak point was 2033. So that's already been refuted, but there's no doubt whether it's 50, de you know, 50 decades from now or the next century, uh, unless we do something like peat recovery, uh, we can help stave off uh, that, uh, that peak point. So what actually prompted uh, Cordell and that group to do peak phosphorus? Well, it was the sticker price shock in 2008 uh, when all fertilizer prices went uh, skyrocketing. Uh, so th this shows the trend as uh, a, a, a cost per pound to the farmer for fertilizer, where phosphate, again, being a finite resource and uh, the most <coughs> energy intensive and expensive to make on a commodity basis uh, came in at about 80 cents, well, almost, almost a dollar a pound. Uh, and as you can see, uh, after 2008, we have a, a graph here that goes to 2013. So you have your dips and valleys, so just like any other supply demand economic curve, but the general trend is still upward. Uh, but then what happened is, uh, 
most recently, and I, I think you all saw the pie chart uh, where Morocco has the most reserves, 80% of, of the global reserves are in Morocco. Well, <coughs> some huge Morocco plants came online uh, about the beginning of January of 15, and that capacity drove the price down from the $480, $500 ton for superphosphate to uh, 340 or back where we were before the sticker price. So the, the, the bottom line is uh, it's very hard to equate the econ economics when you're dealing with a commodity bulk product that uh, uh, a farmer can buy for mm. you know, 70 cents a pound of pea uh, in, in the bulk market. So hence we look at uh, maybe some ways to uh, more highly valorize that valuable finite resource. So here's a quick summary of reduction recovery of, of P. We've got you know, the enhanced biological phosphorus does reduction. Chemically enhanced phosphorus removal, the alum addition is reduction. So uh, we've talked about the struvite uh, brush eye precipitation gives you recovery. Uh, back in the 1990s, early 2000, uh, the Italians came up with an uh, exotic ion exchange resin called Remnut, highly affinity, uh, uh, high affinity for phosphorus, uh, but it was like almost $3,000 a cubic foot, so it was uneconomical. The Japanese tried to do the same thing, the Sahi Kasai, and that was uh, tested in Kansas uh, uh, through Black and Veatch, and that didn't turn out to be uh, economical, but it does offer you a recovery through for regeneration of the, of the captured material. So now we also have uh, a host of selective media from uh, waste materials, uh, wastewater sludge itself with its uh, metal content uh, has an affinity for phosphorus. Uh, uh, the uh, bauxite uh, red mud has, uh, uh, you know, waste product from the bauxite uh, process has uh, uh, an affinity for phosphorus and uh, uh, blast furnace or electric arc furnace slag, a combination of calcium and iron slag has, uh, and there are a few products out there uh, based on, on these waste materials. What I'm going to talk about is an advanced ion exchange, a hybrid ion exchange resin that has uh, a nanotechnology element, nano iron oxide, uh, and let's go right into that. Uh, so again, here's the you know, Stero Struvite. We talked. Uh, Washington State uh, uh, gave some presentations on their dirty sand, or sorry, clean sand uh, uh, Struvite. Uh, uh, Trias Quick Wash for poultry litter, uh, and the Europeans have actually done uh, a high peak compost uh, uh, product. Uh, so you could do a thorough liquid solid separation and actually end up with P-rich solids, and we've seen these numbers generally 90%. Uh, so Quasar has their PRS system uh, uh, off of their digester project work, and uh, the photo is the uh, uh, stages of uh, filtration, liquid solid separation, to their end product, uh, which has about 90% 90% solids P removal and 10% uh, residual in this last speaker. Uh, Clint gave his presentation on uh, uh, another filtration, centrifuge, uh, vacuum filter liquid separation, and uh, what he does to do the polishing of the residual soluble is add more chemicals, either coagulants or lime, uh, to remove the particles uh, and either make a little more fertilizer or at least clean up uh, the uh, the effluent for discharge. Uh, the here, I'll, I'll, I'll correct that. Oh, we actually add iron oxide, not lime. Okay. <laughs> Other than that, it's true. Okay. <laughs> but macro iron oxide, as we'll go over in a, in a little iron bit. Iron Okay, we, yeah. just, uh, we just heard about quick wash. So the ESRI is an alternate approach that focuses on that soluble reactive phosphorus without any chemicals, no precipitation, and no land applied fertilizer products as the outcome. So how do I do that? Well, a quick definition of, of nano. So obviously it's material-based. Once we are able to measure things at that level, materials at that level, 
then we can begin to manipulate and do some manufacturing. And now we have a nanotechnology industry uh, with three main components. I color coded it, we've got obviously materials. EPA and other organizations have defined the critical dimension as one to 100 nanometers. So technically, by definition, if you're greater than 100 nanometers in size, you're not really in a nano world. But what's interesting is the red part is that at the nano scale, uh, you end up sometimes with some really bizarre, unusual properties different than the macro scale. And I'll actually show an example of one of my uh, phosphorus nano composites that exhibit that. So bottom line, really small stuff, but different. Uh, so the nanotechnology gives you small stuff, but high, high surface, and it's high surface area that makes the adsorptive kinetics so fast and makes it competitive with precipitation products. So just uh, pictorially, you have a 100 micro, uh, micron uh, sand particle. Uh, if you uh, get it into nanoscale at 10, 10 nanometers, well, look at all those surface sites for absorption. Uh, from a, a surface area, it's nine square centimeters to 300 square meters. From particles, it's 100 particles at uh, one milligram uh, to 100 trillion particles. So this technology has been applied in the arsenic drinking world. When the EPA changed the health standards from 50 ppb to 10 parts per billion, uh, the current technology couldn't, uh, couldn't get you down to 10 activated alumina. Uh, so iron oxide chemistry uh, led the charge, and uh, this bar chart shows uh, in terms of bed volumes to treat 40 ppb arsenic water to less than 10, uh, it took 5,500 uh, uh, bed volumes of the granular iron oxide. Through a couple of iterations of the nano uh, ion exchange resin, uh, now called Lane RT, we took that 5,500 to get the same performance results to over 100,000 bed volumes. So that's the power of high surface area uh, nano uh, iron oxide. So in a, in a, in a water treatment uh, world, uh, where if you're trying to do chemical removal, you have uh, this type of chart where the metal salt to P ratio stoichiometrically is about 1.8 to 1 at the standard to, to get 1 uh, milligram per liter discharge of P. To get to some of these restrictive standards that you see out in Chesapeake Bay or Snake River, Idaho, where you, you're down to 0.2 or even lower, but now your stoichiometry really gets out of hand. It's over 4 and your chemical costs go through the roof, and it just doesn't make sense. Inversely, with ion exchange chemistry, you actually start with a fresh bed, you come out non-detect, basically, and you go through a typical ion exchange breakthrough curve, and if you manage, if this line is your discharge limit, well then you just change vessels as comfortably below, and uh, in, in all this territory, you're that far below your permit, you can get your nutrient training credits uh, uh, right off the bat. Uh, so some uh, testing of the, of the Lane RT material, all beaker, static mixed dose tests. Uh, I used uh, milk parlor wastewater. Uh, it came in at about 14 ppm uh, uh, total phosphorus. We diluted it to one uh, part per million to kind of uh, equivocate to the national discharge standards. And these blue blue charts uh, uh, on the left-hand side were macro products, uh, an iron oxide coated sand, the red mud, and, and these two are, uh, and this is percent uh, phosphorus removal, are, are the two uh, uh, nano products, the uh, Lane RT ion exchange, and another <coughs> nano composite that, that I'm running out of time to talk about. Uh, so, the, so this, this led us to the obvious conclusion that nano is better than macro. And then a, a few more tests. Uh, always had uh, Lane RT as the, the, the hybrid ion exchange resin as, as the leading product. So we're, we're going with that. So here's the regeneration chemistry. Uh, so it's, it's, it's ligand. It's, it's not exactly ion exchange chemistry. Uh, so the nano 
uh, iron oxide is associated with the resin. It'll actually bond, or, or uh, you have the uh, physiochemical uh, uh, bonding of a phosphate ion onto the resin, and you release, uh, you release the phosphorus, though the other way, uh, by regenerating with uh, weak alkaline solution, caustic soda. But sodium doesn't add any nutrient value, so I'm proposing regenerate with ammonium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, or a combination of both. Uh, so I mentioned nitrate too. Uh, so there's a new formulation using zirconium oxide nano on a chloride uh, form resin. And, and that's why I did iron or zirconium in the ligand re reaction. Uh, but I could do straight iron exchange reaction uh, in, in the chloride form, regenerate with uh, like KCL and, and release nitrate. So here's an illustration of the chemistry. Uh, you have uh, phosphate-loaded water, sorption, phosphate-free water as the F1. Uh, sat the, all the sites get saturated. Uh, you add your alkaline, so I'm proposing a combination of potassium and ammonium, and you end up with ammonium phosphate solution. Uh, you give it a uh, acid rinse to uh, get your pH back to neutral and clean up the resin. And now you take it back out to the field to do more capture. So in the lab and in some of the field demonstrations, uh, we've been able to get to about 10 to 12. We're targeting 15 to 20, uh, because obviously the more times you can reuse the product, uh, you lower your product cost. So if we could do uh, let's say uh, almost 20, we'll, we'll have a 90% reduction in the, in the product cost. So here's an elution curve that shows what, uh, what we can do regardless of the source water, whether you're at 6 ppm, 40 ppm, 0.1 ppm out of, at a pristine lake that's been impaired with, with algae you'll always end up with this curve if, if you've got a fully saturated uh, media, where the peak point is about, uh, well, I'll call it 1500 as PO4, orthophosphate. So that's equivalent to about a 0.1% P2O5 fertilizer solution. So if I concentrate that up and I'm adding combinations of nitrogen and potassium, I can make uh, hydroponic fertilizer mm -hmm. feed solutions. Here, so here's a common product you can get off Amazon.com. Uh, a 216 uh, sells for $93. Uh, so that ag fertilizer valued back at that original graph, and I was very generous. I bid it at the 480 <coughs> ton mark, is 70 cents a pound. You've got nutrient trading credits, uh, Pennsylvania, when they actually were doing dollar value instead of just straight trading. Uh, instead of just straight trading, when 2012 was four dollars, just for the environmental impacts that I talked about. Uh, the uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, put out a PA fact sheet in 2013, comparing P recovery costs or P load reduction costs on BMPs, and they looked at animal waste management at thirty dollars, forest buffers at 25, grass buffers at 11, cover crops at 72. So if, uh, depending on the number of regenerations and the loading rates uh, averaged over the watershed, with the uh, nanomaterial, I could come in at uh, <coughs> four to $11 per pound of the P removed, which beats all of the uh, best management practices. All right, so, so how does that get us to non-fertilizer? So I applied the Pareto's law. 80% of the phosphate production goes to fertilizer. The other 20% goes to uh, 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 non-fertilizer, industrial, water treatment, flame retardants, uh, et cetera. So I'm thinking take these small amounts of recycled pollutant nutrients and flip that. And if the nutrients serve as biocatalysts to form these harmful algae blooms, why not turn the inorganic chemicals into chemical catalysts. So I have a whole li list uh, uh, fluidized catalytic uh, cracking uh, catalysts, 
that use ammonium phosphate to do a phosphate zeolite uh, supported uh, uh, material, lithium battery, uh, cathode materials use uh, uh, lithium ferry phosphate. Uh, so here's, a, here's a, a price chart on lithium fe uh, ferry phosphate in the, in the battery world. The blue chart, uh, the, the blue bars uh, signify raw material costs, 75 cents a pound, and most of that is lithium since it's also a uh, uh, finite resource uh, uh, material. Uh, but the selling price is over $9 a pound. So that that's where we get the valorization of that same P, thinking of it in the catalytic world, the high price world, uh, for our valorization. Thank you. All right. Let's give him a hand.